Wayne Gacy was called the worst of all murderers by the prosecutor, a man responsible for enough misery to last a century. It took the jury less than two hours to reject the defense argument that Gacy was insane and to find Gacy guilty of murdering 33 young men during a seven-year killing spree. Gacy showed absolutely no emotion as all the murder counts were read, but he winked before he left the courtroom. Gacy's killings, which began in January 1972, ended in December 1978, when police discovered dozens of bodies buried in makeshift graves under his suburban Chicago home. Gacy admitted luring the young boys to his home with promises of drugs, liquor, or construction jobs, then forcing them to have sex with him before killing them. Prosecutor William Kunkel had told the jury not to show sympathy, only justice. What I suggested to them was that if they allowed that man, John Gacy, to walk the earth, then indeed God help us all. 18-year-old Delilah Evans walked into the courtroom biting her lip. She was hearing voices. Uh, she was uh, seeing shadows. She, she, was, she was in bad shape. Uh, psychologically. Schizoaffective disorder, a combination of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. She was 17 when she stabbed her brother in the hand and then stabbed her mother to death. It happened on Christmas Day 2016 in their Clinton Township apartment. Her mother, 45-year-old Sonia Riang, was disabled and using a wheelchair to get around. But even after Evans was arrested and charged with first-degree premeditated murder, her siblings came to her defense. The jury rejected an insanity plea found Evans guilty but mentally ill. In court, she watched with little to no emotion, squinting at times, shifting in her seat. I can't imagine how you could plunge a knife 120 times into your mother. She showed virtually no reaction when he sentenced her to life in prison without parole. So is there any clue you can give us as to where she might be? I can give you a clue early on. Um, I think she's a little center. An appellate court sentenced a formal employee of Seoul Metro to life in prison Tuesday for stalking a female co-worker and murdering her in a public restroom last year. The Seoul High Court meted out the sentence to Chun Ju Han for stabbing the woman to death at Shindan subway station in Seoul last September. The killing took place a day before Jen was set to face a court ruling on separate charges of stalking her on a total of 351 occasions and illegally filming and blackmailing the victim in late 2021. A district court had sentenced Chun to 40 years in prison in the murder case. He was separately given an additional nine-year prison term for stalking the woman. The two cases have since been combined for an appellate ruling for which prosecutors have demanded capital punishment for Chun. The Seoul High Court delivered life imprisonment for Chun, saying the murder was committed in a very organized and thorough manner. The case against Chun will be automatically referred to the Supreme Court for a final ruling as a defendant given life imprisonment. A horrifying discovery in the hallway of this apartment building in Ocean City. According to court documents, 46-year-old resident Jeffrey Surgent called 911 around 4 p.m. on Friday, telling the dispatcher he had bipolar disorder and that he had just killed his mother. When police arrived, they discovered Surgent lying on top of his mother's body, which had been decapitated. Court papers say once police arrived, Jeffrey repeatedly apologized for killing his mother and was singing a religious song as he was taken into custody. He was one of Illinois' most notorious killers, but just how notorious, we don't know. It was a secret he kept in life, but he may reveal it in death.
Police say they think Larry Eiler was a serial killer with at least two dozen victims, maybe as many as 50. He died in prison, but the story isn't over yet. He reportedly made some dying declarations. Eiler was arrested for the brutal stabbing murder of Ralph Calise in 1983, but released on a legal technicality. One year later, Eiler killed and dismembered 15-year-old Danny Bridges in his north side apartment, leaving the body parts in a dumpster outside. Eiler was a suspect in the murders of up to 50 other young men and boys in Wisconsin, Indiana, and Illinois. He died of AIDS at the Pontiac Correctional Center, but may have done some talking first, implicating himself and possibly others in the unsolved crime. Did Eiler leave police with clues on Little or others? Cops wish they could have talked to him first. Most people are just happy he's gone. Is he the worst serial killer? I would say yes. On July the 14th, 1974, on that day, two young women, Janice Ott, Denise Naslin, had vanished from Lake Sammamish. There were witnesses who saw a man, a man calling himself Ted, wearing a cast on his left arm, walking away with Miss Ott. She was wheeling a yellow bicycle. The women were never seen again alive. A composite picture was released to the news media, but Ted was seen with a light brown Volkswagen. He was described as 5'7 to 5'8, neckling hair, brown to light brown, dark tan, 160 pounds, cast on the left arm. After this picture appeared, the task force leader, Captain Nick Mackey, received one call among thousands of others. This particular caller said a man named Ted Bundy looked, quote, something like the picture and had a brown Volkswagen. At that moment, Bundy joined a growing list of almost 3,000 men under investigation. Bundy, Bundy's a rumpkin. Bundy's a poop butt. Bundy's his mama's boy. Bundy's out there trying to prove something to his own manhood. That's got nothing to do with me. I don't roll around with poop people like that. I stand with people that can stand with themselves. What do you think about what he said about pornography? Pornography? I've been looking at it all my life and it hasn't affected me anything. Who do you think I am, girl? If you could pick all the words of the vocabulary that your mother told you, who do you think I am? And this is only a couple hours. Can you imagine what it would be like a couple days with me? I live a hundred years a day. On August 10th, 1977, David Berkowitz, also known as Son of Sam, a serial killer in New York, was arrested. Berkowitz was responsible for killing six young people and wounding seven others with a 44 caliber revolver, giving him his other nickname, the 44 caliber killer. The 24-year-old, who was later diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, claimed to hear voices of demons that told him to commit murder, including from a black Labrador retriever owned by his neighbor named Sam Carr. During the one year he spent terrorizing New York City, Berkowitz sent bizarre and threatening letters to his neighbors. They began to suspect him to be the son of Sam and reported him to local police, led to his arrest where he admitted to being the son of Sam. Pleaded guilty to the murders and was given six sentences of 25 years to life, which was the maximum penalty allowed at the time. He has since been denied parole. Alicia was allegedly shot, dismembered, and her remains set on fire by her boyfriend, a father of two daughters. 31-year-old Ivan Alfaro Escobedo was charged with murdering his girlfriend at this farm near Gilroy, months after she had accused him of raping and assaulting her. Authorities say Escobedo shot and killed his 33-year-old girlfriend in his car at a relative's farmland property, cut up her body in a bathtub, and then burned the remains. A witness reported seeing a fire burn for several days in barrels on this land back in July. Police say they found bloodstains in the bathtub and in the front passenger seat of his Honda Accord. The investigation began in April when Salazar told police Escobedo had raped and assaulted her. In July, police Escobedo called the victim's sister and grandmother, threatening to kill his girlfriend and her family if she reported the rape. Judge ordered the defendant held without bail, saying if he was released, he'd be a danger to the public. 33 in total, young men between the ages of 14 and 22 lured into his home, sexually assaulted, and murdered. Gacy, who sometimes worked as a volunteer clown, was convicted and eventually executed by lethal injection, but a mystery remained. 
eight unidentified victims. Now more than 30 years later, with modern technology at his disposal, Chicago Sheriff Tom Dart wants to know who they were. Now through DNA, families that had no hope of having a match now have the absolute hope. We can be definitive in saying this is or is not your loved one. So the police dug up the eight sets of remains and sent them to this lab at the University of North Texas for DNA analysis. I, it didn't really occur to me to shoot an abortionist myself until it was eight days prior to the shooting. I was touching up a car on a, on a used car lot and it hit me that um, what would happen if I were to shoot an abortionist myself. I'm smiling now about it, but I wasn't smiling then. It was a very grim task. They pulled in past me and I took about ten steps to where my, I had laid my shotgun and pulled it out and um, there was a wooden fence that at that point it scared me from their view and I stepped out from behind the fence and raised the shotgun and, and, re and fired three times. The first three shots they were directly at the driver and I think he absorbed most of the shot. And the abortionist was three more shots and he stopped moving. There's also no question that I hope others will act in ways similar to the way I acted. So yeah, I hope to encourage others to defend the unborn much as I did. So when the prosecution first announced they were going to be seeking the death penalty, the, the heightened threat definitely served to increase my joy. <laughs> it really did. There's been many a psychiatrist that has been interested in what I'm trying to tell you, gentlemen. I, I have dealt with um, different personalities all my life. One personality is a gentleman named Enad, who is a Jesse James type. He's not a good person, but he's not really an evil person. But the, the person that I really have struggled against to, to prevent becoming, to, to prevent ruling um, my... My, my thoughts and stuff is a person called uh, Gemini who is, is um, he is in the period. What? And I ain't got no money to blame but myself. You, you gentlemen are honorable people. I wish I could be you, but I wouldn't want me to be me. I wouldn't want anybody to be me. People say Danny has no remorse. They don't know Danny. Quite a story out of Milwaukee where police say after years and years of searching, they have a serial killer behind bars today. DNA evidence has now linked this man, 49-year-old Walter Ellis, to nine dead women. So far, he's been charged in two of the murders. Police say he's responsible for killings dating all the way back to 1986. These nine homicides were spread out over 20 years and basically hiding amongst the statistics of two, 2,000 other murders. His DNA was not in the database. Uh, Wisconsin's law mandated the collection of DNA from all felons in 2000. He was released from prison in 2001. So his DNA was not in the base. So we were, we were looking for a mystery man for some period of time. And consequently, matches were not achieved even three years ago that were capable of being achieved this year. The second thing, of course, is that this pattern was buried in a much larger homicide problem than Milwaukee had. Look at the top of your screen. A month ago, in broad daylight, something is about to go down. There's a thin male and a heavyset male that approached the home. Those two came to this northwest Atlanta street, Main Street. Now going back to the surveillance video, the homeowner in black steps into the yard. And they eventually engaged in a physical altercation between the homeowner and the heavyset male. The homeowner actually produces his own firearm. The thin male produces a handgun and shoots the victim several times. That resident, identified as Jeremy Charles, collapsed in his front yard. A possible motive? robbery. Well, it does appear that they, there was some type of a connection. Those two came to that home specifically. Investigators need your help identifying the two in the video. They arrested a man said to have provided transportation. He's an older guy named Spencer Douglas Henry. Well, you don't have to be the one that pulls the trigger necessarily, but being a party to that crime uh, can land you in serious trouble as well. Everybody, move! Get out! Get out! 
In a lightning bolt of emotion, Michelle Blair admits to killing her 13-year-old daughter, Stoney Blair, because she believed the teen and her 9-year-old son, whom she's also accused of murdering, had been harming her youngest child. Blair is charged with their murders. 9-year-old Stephen Berry and 13-year-old Stoney Blair were found dead in their mother's freezer earlier this year. Investigators believe Blair killed little Stephen first in 2012 and put him in her freezer. Then they say a year later, Blair killed her 13 13-year-old daughter. That is not the case. The fact that they were never there for their children. I had to struggle with them all the time. They were never there. You get Steve, your You know we had to beg you. Me, Steve, and all of us just to cry for you. You're not gonna be able to stand up there. Come here. Come here. In 1987, in Cincinnati, Ohio, forensic pathologist Lee Lehman is investigating Donald Harvey's seemingly outrageous claim that he's killed 24 people. Donald Harvey was a 35-year-old man who had been working in hospitals since he was 18 years old. He said he couldn't remember all of them. And Subsequent to that, people who have really looked into the case deeply believe that Donald Harvey killed in and out of hospitals as many as 130 people, which makes him the most prolific serial killer in American history. Police now have more than enough evidence to put Gacy away forever but they're still trying to assemble the puzzle of Gacy's killing spree. When Snow checks the collarbones of the skeletons found under Gacy's house, none of them are fully fused. These victims were all less than 30 years old. The next question, what were the genders of Gacy's targets? First, Dr. Snow will focus on the size and shape of the femur, or thigh bone. The head of the femur, the part that fits into the pelvis, tends to be much larger in males than it does in females. Forensic anthropologists can also look to other bones for clues, like the pelvis. Females usually have a wider, rounder pelvis to accommodate childbirth. Police have recovered very complete skeletons, so Dr. Snow has enough markers to confirm each victim's gender. Based on these bones, the overall the overall snapshot of Gacy's victims comes more clearly into focus. They're not only young, they're all male. First, a woman's torso was found in a multicolored bag in a shopping cart here on Pennsylvania Avenue in East New York. Then a few days later, just a few blocks away on Jamaica Avenue, a woman's leg was found. Police are now saying this was the work of a serial killer. Surveillance video led police to this apartment building where they saw a woman carrying that same multicolored bag. 83-year-old Harvey Marceline, a transgender woman, was the person seen on the video. They found a woman's head and electric electrical saws inside Marceline's apartment and who spent more than 50 years in prison for killing two different women, ex-girlfriends. First in 1963, in that case, Marceline received 20 years to life in prison. After being released on lifetime parole, Marceline was convicted again in 1986 for manslaughter. This time, the victim's body was found in a bag near Central Park. In 2019, Marceline was released from prison. For now, she's accused of concealing a corpse. There is also an inmate on the loose in Indiana. He is James Burns, and police think he may be headed here to get back at convicted killer Larry Eiler. But this is the man, say police, who may be behind it all. David Little paid the escapee possibly to get revenge on Eiler. Why? Eiler had recently accused David Little of being involved in the murder that Eiler was convicted of. Little was accused. But now police believe possibly Little wants to get back at Eiler and may have paid off inmate James Burns to kill two people associated with Eiler. They are Kathleen Zellner, Eiler's attorney, and Geraldine Kalarek, who wrote a book about Eiler. Both tonight are under police protection. Eiler is on death row for the killing and dismemberment of a Chicago teenage male prostitute. One of South Korea's most infamous serial killers, Yoo Young Tar, was transferred from the Taegu Correctional Institution to the Seoul Detention Center last week. In 2005, South Korea's Supreme Court upheld the death penalty, and he has been in death row ever since. Yoo confessed to killing at least 20 people between 2003 and July 2004 after he was captured. 
Many of the victims were women who worked at tea houses and drinking spots. He shocked investigators at the time by saying he would have killed at least 100 people if he had not been apprehended. Yu had initially blamed his turbulent childhood and a bad marriage for his actions, but later thanked the prosecution for demanding the death penalty. Police arrived at the two-story home in March. Urgent confusion clouded the crime scene. Simon's 13-year-old son, Dane, came stumbling into their backyard, covered in blood, stabbed more than two dozen times. Snipers set up outside the house, and then Simon's oldest son, 15-year-old Kyle, came outside shirtless and confused. Bodies in the house as well as, well as suspects in the house, both. Eventually, police figured out there was one body in the house. 13-year-old Giovanni Sierra stabbed to death in the upstairs loft. And downstairs, hiding in the study, the suspected killer, 17-year-old Corey Johnson. Is he holding the knife? Yeah, he has a knife in his hand. So he just closed the door. He just closed the door. The dawning daylight revealing the awful trail of blood throughout the house leading to Giovanni's body one day after his birthday. Police say Johnson was influenced by violent jihadist videos, and he told them Giovanni was making fun of his newfound Islamic beliefs. He awaits trial on murder and attempted murder charges. The seeds of Robert Long's capture were planted two weeks ago tonight with the abduction of 17-year-old Lisa Marie Rhodes as she bicycled home from her job at this North Florida Avenue donut shop. We were confident we had the right suspect and uh, we felt uh, it was imperative for us to move as quickly as possible. Three o'clock Friday afternoon. Detectives who'd been maintaining a 24-hour vigil watching Long had tailed him to this cinema in a North Del Mabry shopping center. They moved in just as he left the movie theater and headed to his car. He was arrested without resistance right here. Task Force detectives say they have such a strong case against Long that even if they didn't have Long's statements, fiber evidence and items taken from Long's apartment would have been enough to charge him with all nine murders. There could have been more murders if the pieces had not come so quickly together before Long's arrest. The suspected Davis serial stabber sent shockwaves of fear and panic across the Davis community as families demand justice. Tonight, both the Yolo County District Attorney's Office and the Public Defender's Office agree the suspected Davis stabber Carlos Dominguez is not competent for trial. This development comes as both sides disagreed on that assessment, which led to the competency jury trial. Dominguez, the former UC Davis student, accused of stabbing three people, killing David Bro and Kareem Najim. Dominguez's attorney, Daniel Hutchinson, told ABC 10 he is pleased with the announcement. Hold on, sir, you have a fifth amendment, right? Jail psychiatrist testified that Dominguez had schizophrenia and was gravely disabled. Sacramento defense attorney Mark Reichel has dealt with the similar case, and he says now a state hospital will be tasked to get Dominguez to a level of comprehending the charges he is facing. That could take anywhere from six months to five years. A mass killer who has been in jail for 15 years faces execution next May. In Illinois, a date has been set for John Wayne Gacy's death on Friday. Gacy was arrested in 1978 and convicted in the sex slayings of 33 young men and boys. The U.S. Supreme Court rejected what is seen as the last viable appeal last October. For 14 years, serial killer John Wayne Gacy has been living on appeals. Illinois' Attorney General set up this legal war room to handle today's two final appeals filed by Gacy's lawyers. He won't beg for his life. You can exhaust all the legal remedies possible, but no clemency to leave. Right. The scene in 1978 was gruesome. Body after body found buried beneath Gacy's suburban Chicago home. All young men aged 14 to 21. In the end, Gacy, a successful businessman who often dressed as a clown to entertain children, would be convicted of 33 deaths. 
56-year-old New York nanny Yaselin Ortega, convicted of fatally stabbing two young children in her care, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. A jury found Ortega guilty in April of murdering two-year-old Leo Krim and six-year-old Lulu Krim back in October of 2012. Their mother, Marina Krim, said she returned to her Upper West Side apartment with her middle child, three-year-old Nessie, to find her two children slain and their nanny standing over them, stabbing her own neck with a knife. The motive, prosecutors said, was Ortega's overwhelming financial problems, bringing her 17-year-old son from the Dominican Republic, her workload, and resentment toward Marina for being the mother she, quote, could never be. Ortega spoke for the first time since the trial began. She was her daughter's carer, protector, and only friend. But at 57, Rita Camilleri was killed in the most horrifying manner imaginable. Jessica Camilleri decapitated her mother after stabbing her in the head and neck more than 100 times in their home at St. Clair in Western Sydney. There was about seven knives I was stabbing her with. A few of the knives broke. When that knife broke, I got another one. During the trial, a jury was told the young woman was inspired by an obsession with horror films and was in a fit of rage over the possibility of being returned to a mental health facility. She immediately confessed to the crime. I just kept stabbing and stabbing and stabbing her and I, I, I took off her head. Due to mental health issues, a jury found Camilleri guilty not of murder but manslaughter. She was sentenced to 21 years in prison with 16 years non-parole. As the sentence was handed down, Mrs Camilleri's relatives began sobbing. There is an amended complaint before the court. Uh, Mr McCann, do you wish to make it? We are represented. You have the right to a preliminary hearing. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. Mr. Uh, McCann, do you wish to address the issue? Is it correct that you wish to waive or give up your right to have a preliminary hearing in this case? That's correct, Your Honor. Is this your signature on the form telling me that's what you would like to do? That's my signature. At the time that you signed this form, was it your understanding that what you would be doing this morning is giving up just your right to have this hearing and nothing else? In other words, you are not giving up your right to have a trial. Is that understood? That's right. The waiver of preliminary hearing has the approval of the court. Defendant is ordered bound over for trial before the circuit court. In court today, he was surrounded by 10 deputies. The teen had cuts on his hand, cuts the deputies say that he received when they alleged that he beheaded his 35-year-old mother. Investigators claim that after the murder, he then called 911. And the deputies say when they arrived on scene, they claimed that he was holding his mother's head in one hand and a butcher knife in the other hand. Right now, investigators say they haven't figured out the motive. Investigators say there were two other children in the home at the time of the murders. They were unharmed. Those investigators say at this point they don't know what, if anything, those children may have witnessed. They say I need the police in the ambulance now because um, I've killed four people. Okay, just hold the line. Bear with me. Right. Mate, have you got anything on you that you shouldn't have? No, there's no weapons or nothing. Right. right. Do you just want them to do your coat? Have you, have, have, you, have you armed yourself? Yeah. You have. Have you, got a, have you stabbed yourself, mate? Yeah. I, can see, I can see blood on your hand. Yeah. I've bled quite a bit. Really right, do you want to stay there? Yeah. No, 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 just stay there. Stay there. Just I just don't want to be in front of her. Right, just go around the corner. Just walking wounded at the minute. Obviously, again. Wow, what have you done? Have you done something to anyone else? Yeah. What have you done? Murdered four people. But he's saying that uh, his family are inside and that he believes he has murdered them. Dear me, it's 0747 hours. I'm missing your suspicion of murder. You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence. Mr. Donnelly, you heard what the prosecution just said in terms of presenting to the court a proposed Rule 11 uh, plea agreement. And you also heard what your attorney just said, Mr. Billiman. Are those representations correct in terms of your intentions here this morning? Yes, sir. Mr. Donnelly, you have uh, a number of constitutional rights that the court will now review with you. 
it's important for the court to understand that you fully understand what your rights are and that in the process of entering this plea this morning that in, in effect you are waiving or giving up those rights. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. Coming forward at this time and entering a plea of guilty, you're giving up your right against self-incrimination. If you were convicted at a trial, you would have the right to appeal to another court. If you could not afford an attorney for that appeal, this court would appoint one to represent you. You are giving up your right to appeal of this particular, these particular charges here that you will be pleading to. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. But I want you to tell it like it is if you're going to tell it. O'Neill told jurors he did kill his girlfriend, but only because she murdered their daughter and tried to kill their son. You don't know what happened to my daughter, but you better believe I know what happened to my daughter, and that's why Kenyatta Barron is dead. Prosecutors told jurors O'Neill's conspiracy theories just don't make sense. The evidence against this defendant is mountainous. After more than four hours of deliberation, jurors agreed with the state. The judge complimented O'Neill on his performance. And I have to tell you, um, I think in another lifetime, you would have been an excellent lawyer. But cautioned him on moving forward. As we move into penalty phase, I'm really going to strongly encourage you to consider allowing counsel to now step in. Sentenced to 25 years for murder, 19-year-old Christopher Plaskin uttered just five words in court. Thank you, Your Honor. Demurely declining the offer to speak about the heinous stabbing death of 16-year-old classmate Marin Sanchez, whom authorities say he killed inside their high school on prom day two years ago because she wouldn't go to the prom with him. Back in March, Plaskin pled no contest to the crime in exchange for the 25-year sentence. His lawyer said he was considering an insanity defense. Plaskin could be eligible for parole in 13 years, having already served two years while waiting for trial. Serial killers, a dark and horrifying side of our society. They've been called recreational killers, killers with no apparent motive, human monsters. And in fact, the legends of vampires and werewolves may well have begun when mutilated bodies, the victims of ancient serial killers, were found. Even today, there are deranged vampire killers like Richard Trenton Chase, and killers who seem normal, even charming, while they conduct private campaigns of carnage. Who are these people? What makes them so different from the rest of us? Why do they commit these shots? shocking crimes. There are theories, but no definitive answers. Some experts believe it starts before birth. The killers are born and not made. Others point to the environment, saying that childhood trauma is at least partially responsible. Some call killers insane. Others disagree. Whatever the cause, sane or insane, serial killers are a disturbing puzzle to the public and a challenge to law enforcement agencies which have turned to computerized databases, forensic laboratory techniques, and psychological profile to help find these criminals and bring them to justice. Search and rescue volunteers gathered in the little town of Mount Pleasant. 120 men and women from 18 counties of Utah and Nevada. I just can't say enough on how we appreciate you gentlemen coming down to help. Almost impossible. The crews had hundreds of acres to cover. Ted Bundy's deathbed confessions led searchers to San Pete County. And earlier this spring, they did find some unidentified human remains at the site where Bundy claimed he buried Deborah Kent. We are going into other sites looking for other remains that are possibly in San Pete County. During his deathbed confession, Ted Bundy adamantly denied ever carving his name in a tree. But trees like this on eight sites are the last hope searchers have of ever finding any evidence in this vast area. You just have a unit say they found a TV on a tree. Some of the bones will go to the medical examiner's office, but Sheriff Buchanan says unless they come up with something definite, this was the last official search. What we did was we sent our units out here and we did discover what appears to be a body. Um, the body has clothing very similar to what the victim was last seen wearing. The Kissimmee Police Department confirmed Friday that it is the body of Madeline Soto that was found. In a statement, Chief Betty Holland said, quote, it is with a heavy heart I inform everyone that as we expected, Madeline Soto is deceased. This is a sad day for our community and we mourn the loss of such a young life. 
Madeline's mother's boyfriend, Stefan Stearns, was arrested Wednesday for sexual battery and possession of child sexual abuse material just days after Madeline had been reported missing. Detectives found disturbing videos and images on Stern's cell phone, which they say he attempted to delete. Stern said he had dropped Madeline off a few blocks from her school Monday morning, but Orange County deputies say that isn't true. Instead, we believe she was already dead. The teen who bragged about the riches to police investigating the murder he's now convicted of today seemed like most other convicts. Jail orange and shackles. Hillman convicted of killing 64-year-old William McFarlane after a road rage confrontation in southern Kent County last fall. Evidence at trial showed that Hillman beat McFarlane severely before boasting about what happened. McFarlane was convicted of second-degree murder, which has a maximum sentence of life with the possibility of parole. In that case, he'd automatically be eligible for release after 15 years. But today's sentence makes it so he won't be eligible for 22 and a half years, the minimum sentence, with a maximum of 100 years in the state penitentiary. The assistant prosecutor on the case says he hopes this hits home for the public when it comes to road rage. The teen with the powerful defense team and means he felt worth bragging about. Police today found six more bodies under the John Gacy house. The six bodies bring the total found under this house and garage to 15, all appearing to have been teenaged boys and young men. John Wayne Gacy was also Pogo the Clown, who loved to make kids laugh. He was married twice, divorced twice, and had two children. A Democratic Party precinct worker with political connections. A modestly successful building contractor. His neighbors knew him as Johnny, the life of the party. In his confession, Gacy admitted killing the young men after having sex with them, then burying most of the bodies under his house. The prosecutor called Gacy a vile, evil, diabolical murderer who must be held responsible for his acts. The defense argument is that no one could kill so many people, bury them under his own home, and be sane. After final arguments are concluded, the judge will charge the jury, and the jury will begin deliberating the fate of John Wayne Gacy. So you ran down that street, and is that when you saw the open garage door? Yes. Do you remember when you took your clothing off? I have a, like, I didn't remember it at first, but I have a faint memory of taking my pants off at some point. Do you remember what happened next? Not, no, I, I don't, I don't, like, I have some memory of what happened, but I don't remember how we got in, into the altercation or into the fighting. I don't, I don't remember. You said that you had a machete at that point. Do you remember where you got it? I think somewhere in the garage. I don't know. I think in the left, left corner or something. I don't know. On July the 9th, 2023, just a few weeks ago, she was 37 weeks pregnant at that time. Her water broke at about 10 o'clock in the morning on the 9th. Appropriately, she went over to labor and delivery over the Southern Regional. Uh, they admitted her and put her on an IV. She labored uh, for about 10 hours and then probably around 8.40 in the evening, uh, she was fully dilated and told her to start pushing. Well, during the course of the pushing, uh, the baby stopped descending. There's something called a shoulder dystocia that was recognized and what wound up happening after that is just brutal. Dr. St. Julian came in and she pulled on the baby's head and neck so hard that uh, the bones in the baby's skull, face, and neck were broken. And Dr. St. Julian finally took Miss Ross to the operating room for a C-section, cesarean section, where they cut the belly and delivered the baby through the abdomen. Uh, when the womb was open, the feet came out, the body came out, and there was no head. The head was stuck in the vagina, and the head subsequently, subsequently was delivered vaginally. John Wayne Gacy was found guilty today in Chicago of the murder of 33 young men and boys, all of whom he either induced or forced to have sexual relations with him. He buried most of the bodies under his house and got rid of the others elsewhere. Norma Quarles reports. It took the jury of seven men and five women less than two hours to find John Wayne Gacy guilty of murdering 33 young men. Gacy was convicted of murdering more people than anyone else in U.S. history. He showed no emotion as the verdict was read. 
Gacy, a building contractor, was arrested in December 1978 in connection with the disappearance of a 15-year-old boy. Later that month, police began uncovering bodies from a crawl space under Gacy's suburban Chicago home. 29 bodies were eventually found on Gacy's property, four others found in a nearby river. Gacy had confessed to the killings, but his lawyers claimed he was insane. Gacy said he has four personalities. Saginaw, Michigan, for the sentencing of 23-year-old Stefan Roby. The defendant was convicted of first-degree murder in the shooting deaths of his mother, Lee King, and his 11-year-old sister, Charlia. Roby pleaded not guilty and chose to represent himself at the trial. The, <laughs> but the jury still found him guilty on all charges. Roby makes some final comments. And I feel as though that most of my emotions didn't get back because you were distracted. Well, that, that is totally untrue. Well, and then she was on the stand, your phone kept going off a couple times and you kept asking her, was it her phone? When I came into the courtroom, I seen you on the phone. That is totally untrue. And, and that has nothing to do with it. Yes, it does have something to do with it. You're going to spend the rest of your natural life in prison. Hopefully someday you'll think about that. Get him out of here. I'm done. One of the nation's most notorious serial killers is dead. John Wayne Gacy was executed by lethal injection early this morning at the state prison in Joliet, Illinois. Gacy had spent more than 14 years on Illinois' death row after being convicted of the brutal murders of 33 young men and boys. Most were found buried beneath his home in, in suburban Chicago. Police in Chicago said they have found no evidence that serial killer John Wayne Gacy buried bodies of his victims in the backyard of his mother's apartment building. Holes were dug in the ground Monday after a former Chicago, Chicago detective said that he had seen Gacy near the building with a shovel. Gacy was executed in May of 1994 for killing 33 young men and boys. He had told police he killed 45 young men and the other 12 victims, the reported victims, have never been found. Have you seen a picture of this couple? Yes. Um, when you saw that picture and realized that these were the people that this has happened to, how did you feel? I felt terrible and I really, really don't have words to explain how I feel. It's like, it's like a nightmare. I'm deeply sorry to the family that was affected. I hope that something like this never happens again. I, I didn't ever want to consciously do something like this or I never planned it. I never, I didn't want to do it. And I hope that you can find it in your heart forgive me and I'm so sorry and I never wanted this to happen <laughs> I'm so sorry <laughs> it's like a nightmare <laughs> I, I, I just, I just don't know how to say, I don't know how to put it into words. <laughs> I never want to <laughs> say Austin, are you ashamed of what you did? Yes, 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 yes. A 56-year-old man allegedly killed his 32-year-old live-in partner and later chopped her body into more than 20 pieces using two cutters in order to destroy evidence. This was in Mumbai's Amira Road area and this is very similar to that ghastly Shraddha Walker murder in Delhi. Now, decomposing body parts carried out of the home in plastic bags and bed sheets brought back memories of the Shraddha Walker murder case. The police arrested the man Manoj Sani for killing his live-in partner and chopping up her corpse.
corpse. The victim, identified as a 36-year-old Saraswati Vedya, was found in an apartment on the seventh floor of the residential building uh, late Wednesday. Vedya was living with uh, Manoj Sahani uh, in a relationship for the past three years, is what police have said. And the couple had been residing in the rented flat during that time. Now, the police uh, were alerted to the gruesome scene by residents of the building who complained of an unpleasant odor coming from their apartment. In a telephone interview last week, Gacy claims he did not receive a fair trial. For 14 years I've been fighting the same battle. All I want is the truth to be learned, that I did not commit all the crimes. There were rallies today by those who favor capital punishment. John Wayne Gacy, it's time for you to die! And those who don't. We're not civilized. We're a violent, terrible company country that does not respect life and so we set a bad example earlier today a helicopter transferred gacy to stateville prison there at one minute after midnight 28 witnesses will watch as a lethal injection cuts off his breathing and stops his heart gacy's lawyers argue the process is cruel and unusual punishment the families of gacy's victims call it justice talk about inhumane did gacy think of Anything being humane when he killed, when he tortured and killed our boys? No. Why did you do it? I don't know. I don't know. Do you think you're mentally ill? I guess so. I didn't know though. Did you want to hurt and stab the neighbor that came running over? No, I didn't have any memory of that. I don't... I don't... I only remember him yelling at me. Well, the report is that you severely wounded him and stabbed him multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't remember fighting him or stabbing him. It's all across the back. Right. I don't remember how my hands got like this. From modeling on social media sites like Instagram and OnlyFans to accused killer. I'm Courtney Taylor. Courtney Taylor, whose real name is Courtney Clenny, arrested for the stabbing death of her boyfriend, Christian Obamselli. Clenny was picked up in Hawaii and will be brought back to Miami Day to face one charge of second degree murder with a weapon. A killing happening back on April 3rd inside Clenny's unit. Miami police investigating and Clenny seen here in this video at the time. I do believe she is a killer. Clenny's lawyer says he's shocked by her arrest because it was self-defense. And in a statement explains, Obamselli attacked her and choked her that evening. Courtney had no choice but to meet force with force and that Courtney was seeking treatment for her PTSD and related issues to this case, and it is an absolute injustice to charge a victim of domestic violence and human trafficking with a crime. 